where the long arm of England stretches out towards the far west, where the rivers of the West Country, Tamar, Tavy, Liner and Plym, pour their waters into the great natural harbour called the Sound, there stands the city of Plymouth, cradle of seafarers, haven for shipping, home of the Royal Navy. Approaching from the channel, following the tracks of so many sailors and voyagers, we pass the breakwater which guards the Sound. Across the waters, the ridge of Plymouth Hoe comes into sight, and behind, spreading inland, the city itself. This is the way the enemy bombers came in the last war. They left behind a gutted city whose roofless walls pointed jagged fingers skywards. Today, a new city stands on the ruins of the old, focused on a great civic centre building, one of the most striking municipal buildings in the world. From its roof, the significance of Plymouth's plan for rebuilding is clear. The streets cross, at right angles, a great axis which runs through the city. It culminates at the green of the hoe and a view over the sound. To the west, beyond this elegant 19th century crescent, lies Cornwall. Beside the Guildhall runs the main shopping street, Royal Parade. Here is the heart of the old port of Plymouth, the Barbican. Bless you young women in Plymouth town, there lived a maid, oh mind what I do say. In Plymouth town there lived a maid, and she was mistress of her trade. I'll go no more a roving with you, fair maid. A roving, a roving, since roving's been my room. This is the Plymouth of Elizabeth no I. The harbour of the Tudor seamen, Hawkins, Raleigh, Granville and Drake. I took this maid out for a wall. Today the Barbican houses an artist's colony. I took this maid out for a walk, oh my, what I do say. The Mayflower Steps, from which the Pilgrim Fathers set sail, as did many other notable expeditions, is today a mecca for the tourist. So are the narrow streets of the old port. Drake and his crew must often have tramped these cobbles on their way down to their ship at anchor in the harbour. This is New Street, new in the 16th century. The connection with the sea is still strong. The customs house stands by the quayside, and on the wharves, tucked away behind the streets, casks and barrels are made as they were 400 years ago. Though today, there will very likely be some furniture made as well. The Barbican folk form a little community, keeping their own salty individuality in an age of uniformity. They still live mainly by and from the sea, as any early riser who attends the fish market will tell you. The market begins in the early hours as the trawler men and inshore fishermen unload their catches. Sailors and fishermen stand by to see what their night's work will bring them. Shrewd traders buy for markets in London and the north. And the housewife seeks out a bargain. Then decks cleared and washed down, it's out again to the fishing grounds off the Eddiston Reef or the Lizard Point. American people lead their lives within the few narrow streets huddled around the waterfront. When work is over, it's here that they relax, still in their own particular way.
near the Barbican is a public house called the Burton Boys. If you should ask why it has this rather peculiar name, you will be told that it is a corruption of the Breton Boys. For in 1403, a force of 1,200 men set sail from Brittany and landed here with the intention of pillaging Plymouth. They made their way into the outskirts of the town, the inhabitants fighting back as best they could. All night the battle went on as the invader set about burning the town. Plymouth that the Bretons raided was just a few congested streets, but tiny though it was, it was still the fourth town in 15th century England. Only York, Bristol and London were bigger. 250 years later, we find the town snugly behind massive city walls. It held out for Cromwell, although besieged by the Royalists for three years. A great citadel was built by Charles II when he came to the throne. It was supposed to protect the town, but the citizens of Plymouth, remembering they had fought against his father, knew that it was built to overawe and dominate them. The great turning point in Plymouth's history was in 1691, when two miles away from Plymouth town, King William chose the site for his royal dockyard on the banks of the neighboring Tamar River, to be known as Devonport. For Plymouth, these were the last years of the old town that the Tudor seamen knew. The carefree life that had gone on unchanged for hundreds of years was ending, for the growth of empire and the navy were to bring undreamed of changes to the little town. In just 150 years, the population in the area grew from 8,000 or so in the 18th century to 200,000. With this increase, the town burst its confines, two new towns, Stonehouse and Devonport, came into being. Both were to become part of the city of Plymouth. But now, while the fleets of Britain dominated the seas of the world, these three towns formed the most westerly of the Navy's home bases. I saw two sailors in Devonport City. Their bones were of shell and their eyes were marine. Never forget, said the one to the other, the deeds we have done and the sights we have seen. So the West Country poet, Charles Causley, wrote of the Royal Navy and its hometown. Her Majesty's aircraft carrier Eagle cleaves the historic waters of Plymouth Sound on her way up channel past Drake's Island. These waters have borne countless ships of the Royal Navy on humdrum routine voyages, as well as those that brought fame and glory. The Golden Hind dropped her anchor here after encompassing the world. The English fleet assembled in these waters to await the Spanish Armada. And in present times, the cruiser Exeter limped to her berth after the Battle of the River Plate, and Cairns of the Amethyst brought his tiny ship back to the sheltered waters of Plymouth Sound. on the flight and weather decks, face to starboard. The Commander-in-Chief Plymouth acknowledges the Eagle salute. Plymouth Hope, that historic ridge rising from the sea, crowned by the old lighthouse built by Smeaton on the Edison Reef. It was rebuilt on the hoe here when the rock on which it stood began to crumble. From the waterline, the old port can be seen with New Plymouth rising behind it. Throughout the day, the sound is alive with shipping, for the sea reaches long arms into the city, and often a 10-minute boat trip saves miles of land travel. So little steamers and ferry boats plow their way to and fro. Merchantmen and coastal freighters sail by. A turn at Devil's Point, and there lies the great naval dockyard, employing one man in every five of the city's working population. There are civil wharves and docks too. Strange visitors drop anchor in the lee of Drake's Island. The Denmark was a competitor in the tall ships race. Plymouth Sound offers unrivaled scope for the yachtsman. Almost every summer day sees myriads of sails dotting this magnificent stretch of water. No wonder that many national championships are held here. 
Beside the local sailing, several cross-channel and ocean-going events begin and end in the sound. There's a dinghy park to accommodate this fast-growing sport. 200 craft can be parked here. For the larger yachts, there's a basin with many facilities. Just below the hoe, at the water's edge, the bathers enjoy themselves in the pool. The less energetic watch the view from deck chairs on the terraces. In the days of Elizabeth I, the hoe was rough moorland. Now there are gardens and recreations of all kinds. The hoe theatre, for example. Here, Drake still gazes over the sea. In the shadow of his statue is a bowling green, a reminder of the story of that legendary game of bowls he played before sailing out to do battle with the Spaniards. In the bleakness of February, the first tokens of spring, the promise of warmer days to come, are born from the far Scilly Isles on the western wind. One day, the air is milder, the rivers run fast and clear, the pulse beats quicker. Spring, creeping reluctantly eastwards, has reached the border country of Devon and Cornwall and comes to the Tamar River which divides them. On the broad estuary, the salmon fishers are at work. villages like Calstock awake to the warm sunshine. Nowhere in the world will you find so varied a countryside as these river valleys descending from the high moors. None is so rich in the texture of living things, nor so beautiful. away in the folds of the landscape are pleasant villages and great houses, the show pieces of history. Buckland Abbey was founded by the Cistercian monks in the 13th century. Sir Francis Drake made it his home and spent his last years here. It lies on the edge of Dartmoor, that great highland that forms the heart of Devon. ponies foal on the moorland, and here they rear their young and live in complete freedom. Only in the hardest winter do these sturdy creatures need help from men. In every one of the inlets and river mouths that make up the coastline of the west, there is tucked away either a small fishing village or a tiny port. Two of the loveliest are Newton Ferrers and Nos Mayo on opposite sides of the Yell Mestuary. There are holiday beaches like Cor Sand Bay, sheltered from the channel breezes and looking into Plymouth Sound. On the other side of the headland, beneath magnificent cliffs, Whitsand Bay stretches in a long sweep to Rain Head. The great river valleys of the West Country have always challenged the bridge builder. Brunel threw the Royal Albert Bridge across the Tamar. A hundred years later, a new road bridge stands beside it, carrying the traffic that is the lifeblood of a modern city. A modern city. That Plymouth emphatically is. 
You can see it in the whole conception of the city centre building with its magnificent council chamber alongside. Here, the Lord Mayors and most of the other civic offices are combined under one great roof. The city's coat of arms is set high up on the wall of the rebuilt Guild Hall, the heart of Plymouth's social and ceremonial life. The windows, constructed without the use of lead, out of glass that has been etched and dyed, illustrate scenes from Plymouth's history. Above the dais hangs a magnificent Gobelin tapestry, originally a gift from Napoleon III. The Guild Hall stands at one corner of the great central square with its pools and flowers. Near it is St Andrew's, the mother church of Plymouth, built in the 15th century. Here too are the new law courts. Since the war, over 20,000 families have been rehoused in homes and flats, some strikingly modern, others harmonizing with the old city. Much has been rebuilt. Churches, schools, a new technical college, and dominating the north of the city centre, a modern railway station. As a focal point of the west of England, Plymouth is a great trading community, with streets of shops ranging from department stores down to small specialist dealers. Pedestrian ways, many undercover, make shopping attractive for those in a hurry, as well as for those who have time to just look round. There are new ideas like the shopping square laid out in the style of an Italian piazza, and nearby, an old idea in a new building, the pannier market, where stallholders and small farmers can set up shop in this great covered market, and the thrifty can find a bargain. Besides its shopping centre and the Royal Dockyard, Plymouth has a number of other industries. The efforts of the City Council have brought many new ones to the city. The shoe factory is one. The range is wide, from heavy industry in the shape of the local engineering works to the delicate handling of electronic equipment, a new skill acquired by Plymouth workers in a factory making television sets. Apart from production, industrial research goes on here too. For in the laboratories of an engineering firm, a new important product was evolved. High pressure hose and tube, manufactured from nylon to the highest standards of precision and capable of enduring pressures of tons to the square inch, is already proving itself in hydraulic and control systems throughout industry. Conceived and designed in Plymouth, it is part of the city's answer to the challenge of the industrial age. The city isn't just streets and buildings. It's made up of people, the people who live and work in it. And the future of a city is bound up with its youth. All cliches if you like, but they are still true. What do people in Plymouth do? Oh yes, they go dancing, but what else? Well, they do a great many things. Some humdrum, some exciting. Here are a few. the life of the sea around us in the Marine Biological Laboratory. It's one of the foremost research centers of the world in its particular field. There's an aquarium as well, open to the public.
they print newspapers. For a modern city must make its voice heard in the world with all the elaborate apparatus of modern communication. Plymouth's presses produce two daily and two weekly newspapers for the West. They produce television programmes in Plymouth, both commercial and BBC. There's one of the best of provincial public libraries, set alongside a forward-looking museum and art gallery. They play games from bowling to bingo. And outdoors, there's every kind of sport from pony riding on the moors to deep sea angling. There's the Ballard Youth Club, run on new lines. For it is the only one in Britain where you don't have to be a member. It's open to any and every youngster who comes along. A memorial to one of Plymouth's benevolent eccentrics. There are other things in Plymouth as well. Things by which, more than anything else, the worth of a city may be reckoned. There's a thriving guild of social service, a Cheshire home, and a village on the outskirts specially designed to enable old people to live out their years gracefully. So this is Plymouth today, and these are the people who make it what it is. They are the descendants of those who changed it from the tiny hamlet on the river bank into one of the great maritime cities of Britain. But it's not for them that the city was rebuilt. For the gleaming shops, the modern factories and schools don't hold the key to the new Plymouth. Its future, like that of every city ever built, must, in the long run, depend on its children. <laughs>